Chapter 103 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum the magpie and her children said a magpie to her children it's high time you learn to look for your own food it is indeed and with that she turned the whole lot of them out of their nest and took them into the fields but the magpie's children didn't care about that we'd rather go back to our nest they cried it's so comfortable to have you bringing our food to us in your beak i dare say said their mother but you're big enough to feed yourselves i was turned out of the nest when i was much younger i can tell you that but people will kill us with their bows and arrows said the young magpies no fear of that replied their mother people can't shoot without taking aim and that takes time when you see them raising their bows to their faces ready to draw you must just fly away we might do that said the children but if some one were to throw a stone at us he wouldn't have to take aim well you'll see him stooping down to pick up the stone said the old magpie but supposing he carries a stone in his hand ready why if you're sharp enough to think of that said their mother you're sharp enough to take care of yourselves and with that she flew away and left them end of chapter 103 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 104 of tales of laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Cock, the Cockatoo, and the Black Cock once upon a time the cock the cockatoo and the black cock bought a cow between them but when they came to share it and couldn't agree which should buy the others out they settled among them that he who woke first in the morning should have the cow so the cock woke first now the cow is mine now the cow is mine hurrah hurrah he crew and so pleased was he that in his excitement he awoke the cockatoo half cow half cow sang the cockatoo and woke up the black cock a like share a like share dear friends that's only fair saw see see saw that's what the black cock said and now can you tell me which one of them ought to have the cow End of chapter 104. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 105 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Race Between Hare and Hedgehog It was once upon a time on a Saturday morning in autumn. All the barley fields were still in bloom. The sun was shining. The morning wind was blowing over the stubble. The larks were singing high in the air. The bees were buzzing in the barley blossoms. And the people were going blithely about their day's work. In short, all the world was happy and the hedgehog too. The hedgehog stood in front of his door with folded arms, looked at the weather, and hummed a tune as only a hedgehog can hum on a Saturday morning. 
Now, as he stood there humming, he thought to himself all at once, while his wife was washing and dressing the children, he might as well go for a little walk in the fields, and see how his turnips were getting on. The turnips grew near his house, and he and his family ate as many of them as ever they wanted, and so he looked upon them quite naturally as his property. Well, the hedgehog slammed his door and started for the turnip field. He hadn't got very far, and was just sauntering round the briar bush that stood outside the field, when he met the hare, who was out on the same errand, namely, to look at his cabbages. When the hedgehog caught sight of the hare, he gave him a pleasant, Good morning. But the hare, who was a very aristocratic person in his own way, and very high and mighty in his manner, didn't answer the hedgehog's greeting, but said with a nasty sneer, "'What are you running about the fields for so early in the morning?' "'I'm out walking,' said the hedgehog. "'Walking?' grinned the hare. "'I should have thought you could use your legs for something better.' This remark annoyed the hedgehog, for, though he was a good-natured fellow enough, he was touchy on the subject of his legs, which were, by nature, bandy. "'I suppose,' he said tartly, "'you think your legs are better than mine?' "'That I do,' said the hare. "'It remains to be seen,' said the hedgehog. "'I bet you that if we two were to run a race, I should outstrip you.' "'Absurd!' cried the hare. "'You with your crooked legs. "'But if you're so anxious to try, I've no objection. "'What do you wager?' "'A golden guinea,' said the hedgehog. "'Done,' said the hare. "'We'll start right away.' "'Oh, don't be in such a hurry,' said the hedgehog. "'I haven't had my breakfast yet, and I feel a bit faint. "'I'll come back here in an hour.' "'So away he trotted, for the hare made no objection. "'Then he thought to himself, "'The hare thinks a lot of his long legs, "'but I'll get the better of him all the same. "'For all his haughty ways, he's not so very clever, "'and I'll make him pay. See if I don't.' "'As soon as he got home, he said to his wife, "'Quick, go get dressed. You must come out with me.' "'What's the matter?' said his wife. "'I've wagered the hare a golden guinea. "'I'm to run a race with him, and I want you to be there.' "'Good gracious me!' cried the hedgehog's wife. "'Have you lost your senses? "'How can you think of racing the hare?' "'Don't be so quick with your words, woman,' said the hedgehog. "'That's my affair. "'You mustn't meddle with what you don't understand. "'Look sharp, put on your things, and come along.' "'What was the wife to do? "'She had to obey, whether she wanted to or not.' On the way to the field, the hedgehog said, "'Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. "'In that ploughed field over there, we're to run our race. "'The hare will run in one furrow, and I in the other. "'We begin at the top. "'Now all you've got to do is to stand at the other end of my furrow, "'and directly the hare arrives, you call out to him, "'Here I am already!' "'With that they reached the field. "'The hedgehog told his wife where to stand, "'and went on to the other end.' The hare was there waiting for him. "'Shall we start?' said the hare. "'Right,' said the hedgehog. "'Now then.' Each took up his place. The hare counted. One, two, three. And away he went like the wind. But the hedgehog took about three paces. Then he went back, ducked down in his furrow, and stood there as comfortably as you please, and laughing as if he would split his sides. Now, the moment the hare came rushing up to the other end, the hedgehog's wife called out to him, "'Here I am already!' The hare was quite taken aback, for he made sure it was the hedgehog himself who was sitting there calling to him, since, as everyone knows, a hedgehog's wife looks exactly like her husband. "'There's something not quite right here,' said the hare. "'We must run again back to the starting point.' And away he flew like the wind, but the hedgehog's wife never moved. When the hare got to the other end, the hedgehog called out, "'Here I am, already!' But the hare, quite beside himself with jealousy, shouted, "'We must run again!' "'Right,' said the hedgehog, "'as often as you like.' And so the hare went on, running backward and forward seventy-three times, and every time the hedgehog got the better of him. Every time the hare arrived at one end or the other, the hedgehog, or his wife, called out, "'Here I am, already!' But the seventy-fourth time the hare dropped down dead tired before he got halfway. So the hedgehog took his golden guinea, 
and he and his wife went home very well pleased with themselves. And so my tale is finished. End of chapter 105「Chapter 106 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill Bruno's Story from Sylvie and Bruno Once there were a mouse and a crocodile and a man and a goat and a lion, said Bruno. And the mouse found a shoe, and it thought it were a mouse trap, so it got right in and stayed in it ever so long. Why did it stay in? Cause it thought it couldn't get out again, Bruno explained. It were a clever mouse. It knew it couldn't get out of traps. But why did it go in then? No matter why, said Bruno decisively, and it jump, and it jump, and at last it got right out again. And it looked at the mark in the shoe, and the man's name were in it, so it knew it wasn't its own shoe. So the mouse gave the man his shoe. And the man were welly glad, cause he hadn't got but one shoe, and he were hoping to get the other. And the man took the goat out of the sack. No, I know who hasn't heard of the sack before, and who won't again. And he said to the goat, Who oh, will walk about here till I comes back? And he went and he tumbled into a deep hole, and the goat walked round and round, and it walked under the tree, and it wug its tail, and it looked up in the tree, and it sang a sad little song. Ooh, never heard such a sad little song. It singed it right through. I sawed it singing with its long beard. And when it had singed all the song, it ran away for to get along to look for the man. Who no. And the crocodile got along after it, for to bite it, who know? And the mouse got along after the crocodile. Wasn't the crocodile running? He wasn't running, said Bruno. And he wasn't crawling. He went struggling along like a portmanteau. And he held his chin ever so high in the air. What did he do that for? Cause he hadn't got a toothache, said Bruno. Can't you make out muffin without I splain it? Why, if he'd had a toothache, of course he'd have held his head down. Like this. And he'd have put a lot of warm blankets round it. Did he have any blankets? Course he had blankets, said Bruno. Does you think crocodiles goes walks without blankets? And he frowned with his eyebrows. And the goat was welly flightened at his eyebrows. I'd never be afraid of eyebrows. I should think who would, though if they'd got a crocodile fastened to them like these had. And so the man jump, and he jump, and at last he got right out of the hole, and he runned away, for to look for the goat, you know. And he heard the lion grunting, and its mouth were like a large cupboard, and it had plenty of room in its mouth. And the lion runned after the man for to eat him, Uno, and the mouse runned after the lion. At first he caught the crocodile, and then he didn't catch the lion. And when he'd caught the crocodile, what does you think he did? Cause he'd got pincers in his pocket. Why, he wrenched out that crocodile's tooth. Which tooth? The tooth he were going to bite the goat with, of course. And what became of the man? Well, the lion springed at him, but it came so slow, it were three weeks in the air. Did the man wait for it all that time? course he didn't. He sold his house, and he packed up his things while the lion were coming, and he went and he lived in another town. So the lion ate the wrong man. End of chapter 106 Chapter 107 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Blue Bottle Who Went Courting. 
a gay young bluebottle went out courting and first he flew into the king's palace to woo the king's daughter now she was the most beautiful princess in all the world and had a thousand suitors at her feet so the bluebottle came and settled on her hand and sang zum zum zoo i want to marry you but the princess didn't understand the song she only saw a great blue bottle fly and she tried to flick it off her hand but the blue bottle sat fast then the princess cried out here's a great horrid fly on my hand and it won't move quick someone take it away at that you may be sure all the suitors came running up and made grabs at the blue bottle and the cleverest of them caught him between his finger and thumb and nearly crushed the life out of him but he managed to wriggle free and in his flight he flew at the king himself and settled right on the tip of the royal nose then the king gave a terrific snort and hit the blue bottle such a blow that if it hadn't just missed him he would have certainly been killed by this time i can tell you the blue bottle was in such a state that he didn't know whether he was on his head or his heels so he buzzed round and round the room and was chased from one courtier to the other and dashed his wings against the window panes and at last the king threw his sceptre at him and the sceptre hit the fattest duchess in the room and bounded off and struck the blue bottle on the head you may fancy how that confused the poor thing and so he flew into the fireplace and got his left wing scorched and he only just managed to crawl up the chimney by the skin of his teeth but a maiden blue bottle who was distantly related to his family nursed his wing for him and so pretty soon he was as gay as ever then he said very well if i can't have the princess i'll have the next best thing and so he flew into the king's stable and sat himself down right on the back of the princess's favorite mare zum zum zoo i want to marry you he hummed but the mare took not the least notice of his song she only shifted her feet irritably for the blue bottle tickled her zum zum zoo i want to marry you repeated the blue bottle quite boldly at that the mare gave a flick of her tail and hit the blue bottle slap bang right in the middle of his bright azure waistcoat so that he was sent spinning in among the straw that littered the floor so there he lay buzzing mournfully till the maiden blue bottle came along and rubbed him all over and put him on his feet again and pretty soon he was gayer than ever and thought how he would go courting once more better stick to your own station said his lady friend but he only tossed his head and sniffed scornfully and then he put on a brand new waistcoat and flew into the king's kitchen where the princess's favorite cat lay purring on the hearth and the blue bottle lost no time at all but crept straight into the cat's right ear and sang his song zoom zoom zoo i want to marry you now the cat had just been dreaming the most delicious dream about the fattest mouse you can think of and the buzzing in her ear just woke her up in the most exciting part and so you may guess she wasn't in the best of tempers whether she heard the blue bottle's proposal of marriage or not i really can't say if she did you may be sure it didn't please her for she just made a snatch with her paw and grabbed him by the leg now it would have been all up with him if the maiden relative hadn't flown up in the very nick of time and tickled the cat's nose very well that made the cat sneeze so violently that she let go of the blue bottle's leg and so he flew away but his leg was broken and the doctor came every day for a week and then he sent in his bill and the maiden friend brought all her savings rolled up in an old stocking of her mother's and so the blue bottle paid the doctor and there was an end of that now would you believe it the blue bottle was so young and giddy that his leg was scarcely well before he began to wonder where he should go courting next when there are so many old maids in the world he said it's a bachelor's duty to look around for a wife i'll do it out of charity charity begins at home said his lady friend and blushed in a modest way but the blue bottle was not the kind of person to take a hint 
so he just put on another new waistcoat and away he flew into the woods and there a fine young lady woodpecker was hopping about digging for worms in a ladylike manner now here is a person after my own heart said the blue bottle she doesn't wait for us men to bring her food she just helps herself i might do worse than marry her and without a minute's hesitation he began to buzz round and round the woodpecker singing his old song zum zum zoo i want to marry you when the woodpecker caught sight of him she cocked her tail in a knowing way change of food is as good as a change of air said she and gave a peck that nearly finished the blue bottle there and then and tore his right wing from end to end so there he was sprawling on his back with his legs curled up in agony for a torn wing is no trifle and now the woodpecker would certainly have gobbled him up but just then the faithful maiden friend who had followed the blue bottle because he was bound to get into mischief hurried up when she saw the state of things she didn't stop twice to think but took a dead leaf and dropped it right over the blue bottle now when the woodpecker saw the maiden blue bottle she took her for the bachelor and gave another peck but the maiden flew away and hid behind a fern and so the woodpecker went back to her worms oh oh i am dead i am dead groaned the blue bottle under the leaf nonsense said his lady friend rubbish doesn't die so easily you see she was severe because her pride had been hurt oh dear kind friend don't fly away and leave me begged the blue bottle meekly you've flown away and left me often enough said the lady friend i'll never do it again as long as i live cried he you couldn't if you wanted to said she and stroked the broken wing oh why wasn't i content with a blue bottle bride groaned he no lady blue bottle will look at you now she said for you'll always fly lame as long as you live oh won't you take pity on me asked the poor blue bottle who felt thoroughly humble by this time then his lady friend put her own strong wing under his broken one i'll marry you out of charity she said and flew away with him End of chapter 107「by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 108 How Two Beetles Took Lodgings Once upon a time there was a worthy set of ants who lived together as happily as possible in their little town at the foot of a fine old oak tree. They were honest, peaceable folk and always did as the three queen ants who ruled over them told them to do. The young men stayed quietly at home until it was time for them to get married, and the young ladies, who had nothing else to do, did the same. As for the working people, but here's a curious state of things. You'll never find a working man in an ant city as long as you live, for all the workers are females, even the soldiers. You may take my word for that. Well, as for these they were at it morning noon and night digging and building and fetching food for the whole town looking after the eggs of which there were so many you could never have counted them and seeing that all the baby ants were quite happy and comfortable now things would have gone on very well indeed if other people had only left these worthy ants alone but they did not and this is where my story really begins. One fine day, a set of ants belonging to quite another tribe came to the forest and built themselves a town not far from the first. And these ants, it grieves me to write it, were far from peaceful and honest like their neighbors. To tell the truth, they were nothing more nor less than robbers. 
they had not been very long in the place before their soldiers all women folk too made a raid on the town of the mild and harmless ants and carried off all the girl babies they could lay hands on and the moment the children were old enough to walk they were made into slaves and had to do all the roughest and hardest work well you may guess there was sorrow in the town of the peaceful ants they were too weak to fight their foes and so they just had to sit down and bear it as best they could now what happened once happened again and yet again till at last the harmless ants made up their minds to move and build themselves a new city in another part of the forest and so they did but it was all of no use for the robbers followed them and then the same thing happened all over again so soon as there was a fine fat promising bunch of girl babies in the town the robbers came and carried them into slavery one misfortune followed fast upon another not long after the ants had moved into their new town a beetle and his wife came stalking in and demanded lodgings in the queen's palace they were smartly dressed in blue and green coats of the latest cut but they carried no baggage except a toothbrush that stuck out of the beetle wife's pocket this was suspicious and they looked so hungry and thirsty into the bargain that it was not to be wondered at that the poor queen ant pulled a long face we are travelling for pleasure said the beetle's wife and we shall have much pleasure in staying here as long as we like with that she walked straight up to the best bedroom she said she hoped the sheets were aired and went to bed while her husband talked pleasantly with the three queens and ate three dozen new-laid ants eggs for his supper the unhappy queens soon saw what kind of visitors they had got the beetles made themselves at home everywhere in the palace and out of it and called for whatever they wanted the working ants had to wait on them hand and foot there was the beetle shaving water to be got first thing in the morning and the beetle's wife's cup of milk fresh from the cow for ants you must know keep their cows just as human beings do though the milk of the ant cow is more like sugar water than anything else we have then there never was any one who could do with so many meals in the course of a single day as that beetle and his wife they just ate and drank from morning to night and it was all the ants could do to keep the palace larder stocked all the choicest morsels the finest seeds and salads the workers could bring fell to the beetle's share while the queens got what was left there was no peace and quiet in the town the beetles pried into every hole and corner spread themselves in everybody's parlour and paraded the streets singing and whistling when quiet folks wanted to rest but what was worst of all they showed never a sign of moving on i thought you said you were travelling the bravest of the queens ventured to remark at last why so we were said the beetles but one must settle down some time or other and your air really suits us very well did you hear that whispered one young working ant to another the two had come to the palace with a pitcher of milk just in time to listen to the conversation they'll never leave us said the second ant not unless someone takes steps returned the first ant and pray whose steps and why asked the second you always were stupid said the first one and gave her waist a twitch which is a way ants have when they're put out now if someone were to take my advice she went on but there's nobody in all the town with two pennies worth of spirit nobody would take my advice i suppose you couldn't take it yourself asked the second aunt who really was not quite as stupid as people thought it never occurred to me said the first aunt but now you mention it perhaps i might and then the first aunt thought and thought and the end of it was that she slipped out of the town so soon as her day's work was finished 
and strolled away toward the town where the robber ants lived and presently a fierce old soldier ant came marching out at the gate then the little worker's heart beat very fast and she turned as pale as an ant can turn nothing venture nothing win she said to herself and walked straight up to the soldier hello who are you said the soldier oh i'm a neighbor of yours from beach town said the little ant i'm just taking a stroll before supper a stroll before supper cried the soldier staring very hard you don't seem to have much work to do over there why no i can't say i have said the little ant but i can see by your dress you're a servant said the soldier woman so i am said the little ant but we servants of beach town have an easy place a bit of dusting now and then and a little light needlework that's all i heard a very different story only the other day said the soldier ah but everything's changed since the beetles came said the little worker they do all the dirty work and my goodness they can work you may take my word for that it's worth something i can tell you to have two fine beetles like that in the town aha thought the soldier woman to herself here's something for us and she was so taken up with thinking that she forgot to bid the little ant good night and there and then she marched straight back to her town to tell the general what she had heard but the little ant went home well pleased with herself and sure enough what she expected would happen did happen the robber ants as soon as they heard the soldier's story were eager as possible to carry off the two beetles who could work so well and to prevent any fuss and bother this is what they did they took a great pitcher of ant cow's milk and mixed it with a few drops of the poison which as every one knows an ant always carries about with her in her poison bag then twelve soldiers took the pitcher to beach town and waited outside the gate for the beetles to come out and directly they saw them coming they put down the pitcher and hid behind a mountain of dead leaves but the beetles drank up the sweet stuff till there was not a drop left at the bottom of the pail and immediately the poison began to work and both the beetle and his wife fell back in a heap on to the grass and there they lay and could stir neither hand nor foot the robbers you may fancy lost no time bundled the pair on to a stout rhubarb leaf and dragged them away to their own city as fast as they could go now scarcely had they got them there when the poison began to wear off for ants poison is not very strong you see and pretty soon the beetle's wife sat up and pinched her husband it was not long before he sat up too and by and by those two were as clear in their heads and as firm on their legs as any two beetles ever were and now there was an unpleasant surprise in store for the robber ants when the beetle's wife had looked around a bit she said to her husband why it seems comfortable enough here i don't think we'll trouble to go back to beach town i think this will suit us very well 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 we'll just see what the cooking's like said he and went straight to the palace where the six queen ants who ruled over the robbers lived he just said how do you do to the queens in an off-hand way and then he sat down and helped himself to all the dishes he could find in the larder his wife she did the same and between them they finished all the food there was and so they went on just as they were used to doing in beach town and it did not take the robbers long to find out the mistake they had made the beetles had never done a day's work in their lives and they had no notion of beginning now just because the robbers expected it when they heard how they had been carried off and why they thought the whole affair a very good joke and laughed and laughed till they grew purple in the face and had to slap each other on the back to keep from choking the robbers you may believe me were as angry as angry could be they coaxed and they threatened but neither the beetle nor his wife would do a stroke of work on the contrary they took such a deal of waiting upon that the robbers were driven well-nigh crazy and racked their brains for a way to get rid of them 
but the beetles liked their new quarters very well and there they stopped so things went on till at last the robbers made up their minds to give the beetles the slip and one dark night while they were asleep they packed their trunks and left the town but the gate wanted oiling and creaked so as they swung it open that the beetle's wife got nightmare and woke up in a minute you may be sure she had found out what was going on and had wakened her husband then the two crept very softly out at the gate and kept the ants at a comfortable distance so the end of it all was that though the robbers went far into the forest many leagues from their old town they had no sooner finished building the new one than in marched the beetles and went on in their old way as though nothing had happened now the robbers had settled so far away from beech town that it was not worth their while to come and steal children of the harmless ants for they found another town nearer to hand and so the harmless ants lived together quite happily and peacefully once more and the clever little worker to whom they owed their good fortune was raised to great honour and glory but the robbers had to make the best of the beetles for get rid of them they never could and if you ever should be passing that way why i make no doubt you'll find them there still End of chapter 108「hundred and nine of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pat Mathewson, England. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 109 Little Tuppence one day an old hen whose name was cluck cluck went into the woods with her little chick tuppen to get some blueberries to eat but a berry stuck fast in the little one's throat and he fell upon the ground choking and gasping cluck cluck in great fright ran to fetch some water for him she ran to the spring and said my dear spring please give me some water i want it for my little chick tuppen who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The spring said, I will give you some water if you will bring me a cup. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the oak tree and said, Dear oak tree, please give me a cup. I want it for the spring. And then the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The oak tree said, I will give you a cup if someone will shake my branches. Then Cluck Cluck ran to Maid Marian, the woodcutter's child, and said, Dear Maid Marian, please shake the oak tree's branches, and then the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The woodcutter's child, Maid Marian, said, I will shake the oak tree's branches if you will give me some shoes. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the shoemaker and said, Dear shoemaker, please give me some shoes. I want them for Maid Marian, the woodcutter's child, for then Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The shoemaker said, I will give you some shoes if you will give me some leather. Then Cluck Cluck ran to Moo Moo the ox and said, Dear Moo Moo, please give me some leather. I want it for the shoemaker. For then the shoemaker will give me some shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian. And Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring. And the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The ox, Moo Moo, said, I will give you some leather if you will give me some corn. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the farmer and said, Dear farmer, please give me some corn. I want it for Moo Moo the ox, for then the ox will give me some leather, 
and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The farmer said, I will give you some corn if you will give me a plough. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the blacksmith and said, Dear blacksmith, please give me a plough. I want it for the farmer, for then the farmer will give me some corn, and I will give the corn to the ox, and the ox will give me leather, and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen, who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The blacksmith said, I will give you a plough if you will give me some iron. Then Cluck Cluck ran to the busy little dwarfs who live under the mountains and have all the iron that is found in the mines. Dear, dear dwarf, she said, please give me some of your iron. I want it for the blacksmith, for then the blacksmith will give me a plough, and I will give the plough to the farmer, and the farmer will give me corn, and I will give the corn to the ox, and the ox will give me leather, and I will give the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoemaker will give me shoes, and I will give the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian will shake the oak tree's branches, and the oak tree will give me a cup, and I will give the cup to the spring, and the spring will give me water for my little chick Tuppen who lies choking and gasping under the blueberry bush in the green woods. The little dwarfs who live under the mountains had pity on poor Cluck Cluck, and they gave her a great heap of red iron ore from their mines. Then she gave the iron to the blacksmith, and the plough to the farmer, and the corn to the ox, and the leather to the shoemaker, and the shoes to Maid Marian, and Maid Marian shook the oak tree, and the spring got the acorn cup, and Cluck Cluck carried it full of water to her little chick Tuppen. Then little Tuppen drank the water and was well again, and ran chirping and singing in the long grass as if nothing had happened to him. End of chapter 109 Chapter 110 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The story of the four little children who went round the world. Once upon a time, a long while ago, there were four little people whose names were Violet, Slingsby, Guy, and Lionel, and they all thought they should like to see the world, so they bought a large boat to sail quite round the world by sea, and then they were to come back on the other side by land. The boat was painted blue with green spots, and the sail was yellow with red stripes, and when they set off, they only took a small cat to steer and look after the boat, besides an elderly Quangle Wangle, who had to cook the dinner and make the tea, for which purposes they took a large kettle. For the first ten days they sailed on beautifully and found plenty to eat, as there were lots of fish, and they had only to take them out of the sea with a long spoon when the quangle wangle instantly cooked them and the pussy cat was fed with the bones with which she expressed herself pleased on the whole so that all the party was very happy during the daytime violet chiefly occupied herself in putting salt water into a churn while her three brothers churned it violently in the hope that it would turn into butter which it seldom if ever did and in the evening they all retired into the tea kettle where they all managed to sleep very comfortably while pussy and the quangle wangle managed the boat 
after a time they saw some land at a distance and when they came to it they found it was an island made of water quite surrounded by earth besides that it was bordered by evanescent isthmuses with a great gulf stream running all over it so that it was perfectly beautiful and contained only a single tree five hundred and three feet high when they had landed they walked about but found to their great surprise that the island was quite full of veal cutlets and chocolate drops and nothing else so they all climbed up the single high tree to discover if possible if there were any people but having remained on the top of the tree for a week and not seeing anybody they naturally concluded that there were no inhabitants and accordingly when they came down they loaded the boat with two thousand veal cutlets and a million of chocolate drops and these afforded them sustenance for more than a month during which time they pursued their voyage with the utmost delight and apathy after this they came to a shore where there were no less than sixty-five great red parrots with blue tails sitting on a rail all in a row and all fast asleep and i am sorry to say that the pussy-cat and the quangle-wangle crept softly and bit off the tail-feathers of all the sixty-five parrots for which violet reproved them most severely notwithstanding which she proceeded to insert all the feathers two hundred and sixty in number in her bonnet thereby causing it to have a lovely and glittering appearance highly prepossessing and efficacious the next thing that happened to them was in a narrow part of the sea which was so entirely full of fishes that the boat could not go on no farther so they remained there about six weeks till they had eaten nearly all the fishes which were soles and all readily cooked and covered with shrimp sauce so there was no trouble whatever and as the few fishes who remained uneaten complained of the cold as well as of the difficulty they had in getting any sleep on account of the extreme noise made by the arctic bears and the tropical turnspits which frequented the neighbourhood in great numbers violet most amiably knitted a small woollen frock for several of the fishes and slingsby administered some opium drops to them through which kindness they became quite warm and slept soundly then they came to a country which was wholly covered with immense orange trees of a vast size and quite full of fruit so they all landed taking with them the tea kettle intending to gather some of the oranges and place them in it but while they were busy about this a most dreadfully high wind rose and blew out most of the parrot tail feathers from violet's bonnet that however was nothing compared with the calamity of the oranges falling down on their heads by millions and millions which thumped and bumped and bumped and thumped them all so seriously that they were obliged to run as hard as they could for their lives besides that the sound of the oranges rattling on the tea kettle was of the most fearful and amazing nature nevertheless they got safely to the boat although considerably vexed and hurt and the quangle wangle's right foot was so knocked about that he had to sit with his head in his slipper for at least a week this event made them all for a time rather melancholy and perhaps they might never have become less so had not lionel with a most praiseworthy devotion and perseverance continued to stand on one leg and whistled to them in a loud and lively manner which diverted the whole party so extremely 
that they gradually recovered their spirits and agreed that whenever they should reach home they would subscribe toward a testimonial to lionel entirely made of gingerbread and raspberries as an earnest token of their sincere and grateful infection after sailing on calmly for several more days they came to another country where they were much pleased and surprised to see a countless multitude of white mice with red eyes all sitting in a great circle slowly eating custard pudding with the most satisfactory and polite demeanor and as the four travelers were rather hungry being tired of eating nothing but soles and oranges for so long a period they held a council as to the propriety of asking the mice for some of their pudding in a humble and affecting manner by which they could hardly be otherwise than gratified it was agreed therefore that guy should go and ask the mice which he immediately did and the result was that they gave a walnut shell only half full of custard diluted with water now this displeased guy who said out of such a lot of pudding as you have got i must say you might have spared a somewhat larger quantity but no sooner had he finished speaking than the mice turned round at once and sneezed at him in an appalling and vindictive manner and it is impossible to imagine a more scrupulous and unpleasant sound than that caused by the simultaneous sneezing of many millions of angry mice so that guy rushed back to the boat having first shied his cap in the middle of the custard pudding by which means he completely spoiled the mice's dinner by and by the four children came to a country where there were no houses but only an incredibly innumerable number of large bottles without corks and of a dazzling and sweetly susceptible blue color each of these blue bottles contained a blue bottle fly and all these interesting animals lived continually together in the most copious and rural harmony nor perhaps in many parts of the world is such perfect and abject happiness to be found violet and slingsby and guy and lionel were greatly struck with this singular and instructive settlement and having previously asked permission of the blue bottle flies which was most courteously granted the boat was drawn up to the shore and they proceeded to make tea in front of the bottles but as they had no tea leaves they merely placed some pebbles in the hot water and the quangle wangle played some tunes over it on an accordion by which of course tea was made directly and of the very best quality the four children then entered into conversation with the blue bottle flies who discoursed in a placid and genteel manner though with a slightly buzzing accent chiefly owing to the fact that they each held a small clothes brush between their teeth which naturally occasioned a fizzy extraneous utterance why said violet would you kindly inform us do you reside in bottles and if in bottles at all why not rather in green or purple or indeed in yellow bottles to which questions a very aged blue bottle fly answered we found the bottles here all ready to live in that is to say our great 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 grandfathers did so we occupied them at once and when the winter comes on we turn the bottles upside down and consequently rarely feel the cold at all and you know very well that this could not be the case with bottles of any other color than blue of course it could not said slingsby but if we may take the liberty of inquiring 
on what do you chiefly subsist mainly on oyster patties said the blue bottle fly and when these are scarce on raspberry vinegar and russian leather boiled down to a jelly how delicious said guy to which lionel added huzz and all the blue bottle flies said buzz at this time an elderly fly said it was the hour for the evening song to be sung and on a signal being given all the blue bottle flies began to buzz at once in a sumptuous and sonorous manner the melodious and mucilaginous sounds echoing all over the waters and resounding across the tumultuous tops of the transitory tantamus upon the intervening and verdant mountains which a serene and sickly solvity only known to the truly virtuous the moon was shining sublaciously from the star-bespangled sky while her light irrigated the smooth and shiny sides and wings and backs of the blue-bottle flies with a peculiar and trivial splendor while all nature cheerfully responded to the cerulean and conspicuous circumstances in many long after years the four little travelers looked back to that evening as one of the happiest in all their lives and it was already past midnight when the sail of the boat having been set up by the quangle wangle the tea kettle and churn placed in their respective positions and the pussycat stationed at the helm the children each took a last and affectionate farewell of the blue blotto flies who walked down in a body to the water's edge to see the travellers embark as a token of parting respect and esteem violet made a curtsey quite down to the ground and stuck one of her few remaining parrot tail feathers into the back hair of the most pleasing of the blue bottle flies while slingsby guy and lionel offered them three small boxes containing respectively black pins dried figs and epsom salts and thus they left the happy shore for ever overcome by their feelings the four little travellers instantly jumped into the tea kettle and fell fast asleep but all along the shore for many hours there was distinctly heard a sound of severely suppressed sobs and of a vague multitude of living creatures using their pocket handkerchiefs in a subdued simultaneous snuffle lingering sadly along the walloping waves as the boat sailed farther and farther away from the land of the happy blue-bottle flies nothing particular occurred for some days after these events except that as the travellers were passing a low tract of sand they perceived an unusual and gratifying spectacle namely a large number of crabs and crawfish perhaps six or seven hundred sitting by the waterside and endeavoring to disentangle a vast heap of pale pink worsted which they moistened at intervals with fluid composed of lavender water and white wine negus can we be of any service to you o crusty crabbies said the four children thank you kindly said the crabs consecutively we are trying to make some worsted mittens but do not know how on which violet who was perfectly acquainted with the art of mitting making said to the crabs do your claws unscrew or are they fixtures they are all made to unscrew said the crabs and forthwith they deposited a great pile of claws close to the boat with which violet combed all the pale pink worsted and then made the loveliest mittens with it you can imagine these the crabs 
having resumed and screwed on their claws placed cheerfully upon their wrists and walked away rapidly on their hind legs warbling songs with a silvery voice and in a minor key after this the four little people sailed on again till they came to a vast and wide plain of astonishing dimensions on which nothing whatever could be discovered at first but as the travellers walked onward they appeared in the extreme and dim distance a single object which on a nearer approach and on an accurately cutaneous inspection seemed to be somebody in a large white wig sitting on an armchair made of sponge cakes and oyster shells it does not quite look like a human being said violet doubtfully nor could they make out what it really was till the quangle wangle who had previously been round the world exclaimed softly in a loud voice it is the cooperative cauliflower and so in truth it was and they soon found that what they had taken for an immense wig was in reality the top of the cauliflower and that he had no feet at all being able to walk tolerably well with a fluctuating and graceful movement on a single cabbage stalk an accomplishment which naturally saved him the expense of stockings and shoes presently while the whole party from the boat was gazing at him with mingled affection and disgust he suddenly arose and in a somewhat plumdopious manner hurried off toward the setting sun his steps supported by two superincumbent confidential cucumbers and a large number of water wagtails proceeding in advance of him by three and three in a row till he finally disappeared on the brink of the western sky in a crystal cloud of sodorphic sand so remarkable a sight of course impressed the four children very deeply and they returned immediately to their boat with a strong sense of undeveloped asthma and a great appetite shortly after this the travellers were obliged to sail directly below some high overhanging rocks from the top of one of which a particularly odious little boy dressed in rose-coloured knickerbockers and with a pewter plate upon his head threw an enormous pumpkin at the boat by which it was instantly upset but this upsetting was of no consequence because all the party knew how to swim very well and in fact they preferred swimming about till after the moon rose when the water growing chilly they spontaneously entered the boat meanwhile the quangle wangle threw back the pumpkin with immense force so that it hit the rocks where the malicious little boy in rose-coloured knickerbockers was sitting when being quite full of lucifer matches the pumpkin exploded surreptitiously into a thousand bits whereupon the rocks instantly took fire and the odious little boy became unpleasantly hotter and hotter and hotter till his knickerbockers were turned quite green and his nose was burned off two or three days after this happened they came to another place where they found nothing at all except some wide and deep pits full of mulberry jam this is the property of the tiny yellow-nosed apes who abound in these districts and who store up the mulberry jam for their food in winter when they mix it with pellucid pale periwinkle soup and serve it out in wedgewood china bowls which grow freely 
all over that part of the country only one of the yellow nosed apes was on the spot and he was fast asleep yet the four travellers and the quadrangle and the pussy were so terrified by the violence and the sanguinity sound of his snoring that they merely took a small cupful of the jam and returned to re-embark in their boat without delay what was their horror on seeing the boat including the churn and the sea kettle in the mouth of an enormous sea's prider an aquatic and ferocious creature truly dreadful to behold and happily not only met with in those excessive longitudes in a moment the beautiful boat was bitten into fifty thousand million hundred billion bits and it instantly became quite clear that violet slingsby guy and lionel could no longer premulate their voyage by sea the four travellers were therefore obliged to resolve on pursuing their wanderings by land and very fortunately there happened to pass by at that moment an elderly rhinoceros on which they seized and all four mounting on their back the quadrangle sitting on his horn and holding on by his ears and the pussycat swinging at the end of his tail they set off having only four small beans and three pounds of mashed potatoes to last through their whole journey they were however able to catch numbers of the chickens and turkeys and other birds who incessantly alighted on the head of the rhinoceros for the purpose of gathering the seeds of the rhododendron plants which grew there and these creatures they cooked in the most translucent and satisfactory manner by means of a fire lighted on the end of the rhinoceros's back a crowd of kangaroos and gigantic cranes accompanied them from feelings of curiosity and complacency so that they were never at a loss for company and went onward as it were in sort of a profuse and triumphant procession thus in less than eighteen weeks they all arrived safely at home where they were received by their admiring relatives with joy tempered with contempt and where they finally resolved to carry out the rest of their travelling plans at some more favourable opportunity as for the rhinoceros in token of their grateful adherence they had him killed and stuffed directly and then set him up outside the door of their father's house as a diaphanous door scraper end of chapter a hundred and ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one hundred eleven of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter one hundred eleven the history of the seven families of the lake pipple popple from nonsense stories chapter one introductory in former days that is to say once upon a time there lived in the land of gramble blamble seven families they lived by the side of the great lake pipple popple one of the seven families indeed lived in the lake and on the outskirts of the city of tosh which excepting when it was quite dark they could see plainly the names of all these places you have probably heard of and you have only not to look in your geography books to find out all about them now the seven families who lived on the borders of the great lake pipple popple were as follows in the next chapter chapter two the seven families there was a family of two old parrots 
and seven young parrots there was a family of two old storks and seven young storks there was a family of two old geese and seven young geese there was a family of two old owls and seven young owls there was a family of two old guinea pigs and seven young guinea pigs there was a family of two old cats and seven young cats and there was a family of two old fishes and seven young fishes chapter three the habits of the seven families the parrots lived upon the sofsky pofsky trees which were beautiful to behold and covered with blue leaves and they fed upon fruit artichokes and striped beetles the storks walked in and out of the lake pipple popple and ate frogs for breakfast and buttered toast for tea but on account of the extreme length of their legs they could not sit down and so they walked about continually the geese having webs to their feet caught quantities of flies which they ate for dinner the owls anxiously looked after mice which they caught and made into sago puddings the guinea pigs toddled about the gardens and ate lettuces and cheshire cheese the cats sat still in the sunshine and fed upon sponge biscuits the fishes lived in the lake and fed chiefly on boiled periwinkles and all these seven families lived together in the utmost fun and felicity chapter four the children of the seven families are sent away one day all the seven fathers and the seven mothers of the seven families agreed that they would send their children out to see the world so they called them all together and gave them each eight shillings and some good advice some chocolate drops and a small green morocco pocket-book to set down their expenses in they then particularly entreated them not to quarrel and all the parents sent off their children with a parting injunction if said the old parrots you find a cherry do not fight about who should have it and said the old storks if you find a frog divide it carefully into seven bits but on no account quarrel about it and the old geese said to the seven young geese whatever you do be sure you do not touch a plum pudding flea and the old owl said if you find a mouse tear him up into seven slices and eat him cheerfully but without quarrelling and the old guinea pig said have a care that you eat your lettuces should you find any not greedily but calmly and the old cat said be particularly careful not to meddle with a clangle wangle if you should see one and the old fishes said above all things avoid eating a blue boss was, for they do not agree with fishes and give them a pain in their toes so all the children of each family thanked their parents and making in all forty-nine polite bows they went into the wide world chapter five the history of the seven young parrots the seven young parrots had not gone far when they saw a tree with a single cherry on it which the oldest parrot picked instantly but the other six being extremely hungry tried to get it also on which all the seven began to fight and they scuffled and huffled and ruffled and shuffled and puffled and muffled and buffled and duffled and fluffled and guffled and bruffled and screamed and shrieked and squealed and squeaked and clawed and snapped and bit and bumped and thumped and dumped and flumped each other till they were all torn into little bits and at last there was nothing left to record this painful incident except the cherry and seven small green feathers and that was the vicious and voluble end of the seven young parrots chapter six the history of the seven young storks when the seven young storks set out they walked or flew for fourteen weeks in a straight line and for six weeks more in a crooked one and after that they ran as hard as they could for one hundred and eight miles and after that they stood still and made a himmeltaneous clatter clatter blattery noise with their bills about the same time they perceived a large frog spotted with green and with a sky-blue stripe under each ear so being hungry they immediately flew at him and were going to divide him into seven pieces when they began to quarrel as to which of his legs should be taken off first 
one said this and another said that and while they were all quarrelling the frog hopped away and when they saw that he was gone they began to chatter clatter bladder platter patter bladder matter clatter flatter quatter more violently than ever and after they had fought for a week they pecked each other all to little pieces so that at last nothing was left of any of them except their bills and that was the end of the seven young storks chapter seven the history of the seven young geese when the seven young geese began to travel they went over a large plain on which there was but one tree and that was a very bad one so four of them went up to the top of it and looked about them while the other three waddled up and down and repeated poetry and their last six lessons in arithmetic geography and cookery presently they perceived a long way off an object of the most interesting and obese appearance having a perfectly round body exactly resembling a boiled plum pudding with two little wings and a beak and three feathers growing out of his head and only one leg so after a time all the seven young geese said to each other beyond all doubt this beast must be a plum pudding flea on which they incautiously began to sing aloud plum pudding flea plum pudding flea wherever you be oh come to our tree and listen oh listen oh listen to me and no sooner had they sung this verse than the plum pudding flea began to hop and skip on his one leg with the most dreadful velocity and came straight to the tree where he stopped and looked about him in a vacant and voluminous manner on which the seven young geese were greatly alarmed and all of a tremble bemble so one of them put out his long neck and just touched him with the tip of his bill but no sooner had he done this than the plum pudding flea skipped and hopped about more and more and higher and higher after which he opened his mouth and to the great surprise and indignation of the seven geese began to bark so loudly and furiously and terribly that they were totally unable to bear the noise and by degrees every one of them suddenly tumbled down quite dead so that was the end of the seven young geese chapter eight the history of the seven young owls when the seven young owls set out they sat every now and then on the branches of old trees and never went far at one time and one night when it was quite dark they thought they heard a mouse but as the gas lamps were not lighted they could not see him so they called out is that a mouse on which a mouse answered squeaky peaky weeky yes it is and immediately all the young owls threw themselves off the tree meaning to alight on the ground but they did not perceive that there was a large well below them into which they all fell superficially and were every one of them drowned in less than half a minute so that was the end of the seven young owls chapter nine the history of the seven young guinea pigs the seven young guinea pigs went into a garden full of gooseberry bushes and tiggery trees under one of which they fell asleep when they awoke they saw a large lettuce which had grown out of the ground while they had been sleeping and which had an immense number of green leaves at which they all exclaimed lettuce oh lettuce let us oh let us oh lettuce leaves oh let us leave this tree and eat lettuce oh let us lettuce leaves and instantly the seven young guinea pigs rushed with such extreme force against the lettuce plant and hit their heads so vividly against its stalk that the concussion brought on directly an incipient transitional inflammation of their noses which grew worse and worse and worse and worse till it accidentally killed them all seven and that was the end of the seven young guinea pigs chapter ten the history of the seven young cats the seven young cats set off on their travels with great delight and rapacity but on coming to the top of a high hill they perceived at a long distance off a clangle wangle or as it is more properly written clangel wangel and in spite of the warning they had had they ran straight up to it now the clangle wangles are most dangerous and delusive beasts and by no means commonly to be met with they live in the water as well as on land 
using their long tails as a sail when in the former element their speed is extreme but their habits of life are domestic and superfluous and their general demeanor pensive and pellucid on summer evenings they may sometimes be observed near the lake pipple standing on their heads and humming their national melodies they subsist entirely on vegetables excepting when they eat veal or mutton or pork or beef or fish or saltpetre the moment the clangle wangle saw the seven young cats approach he ran away and as he ran straight on for four months and the cats though they continued to run could never overtake him they all gradually died of fatigue and exhaustion and never afterward recovered and this was the end of the seven young cats chapter eleven the history of the seven young fishes the seven young fishes swam across the lake pipple and into the river and into the ocean where most unhappily for them they saw on the fifteenth day of their travels a bright blue boss and instantly swam after him but the blue boss plunged into a perpendicular speculier orbicular quadrangular circular depth of soft mud where in fact his house was and the seven young fishes swimming with great and uncomfortable velocity plunged also into the mud quite against their will and not being accustomed to it were all suffocated in a very short time and that was the end of the seven young fishes chapter twelve of what occurred subsequently after it was known that the seven young parrots and the seven young storks and the seven young geese and the seven young owls and the seven young guinea pigs and the seven young cats and the seven young fishes were all dead then the frog and the plum pudding flea and the mouse and the clangle wangle and the blue boss was all met together to rejoice over their good fortune and they collected the seven feathers of the seven young parrots and the seven bills of the seven young storks and the lettuce and the cherry and having placed the latter on the lettuce and the other objects in a circular arrangement at their base they danced a hornpipe round all these memorials until they were quite tired after which they gave a tea party and a garden party and a ball and a concert and then returned to their respective homes full of joy and respect sympathy satisfaction and disgust chapter thirteen of what became of the parents of the forty-nine children but when the two old parrots and the two old storks and the two old geese and the two old owls and the two old guinea pigs and the two old cats and the two old fishes became aware by reading in the newspapers of the calamitous extinction of the whole of their families they refused all further sustenance and sending out to various shops they purchased great quantities of cayenne pepper and brandy and vinegar and blue sealing wax besides seven immense glass bottles with air-tight stoppers and having done this they ate a light supper of brown bread and jerusalem artichokes and took an affecting and formal leave of the whole of their acquaintance which was very numerous and distinguished and select and responsible and ridiculous chapter fourteen conclusion and after this they filled the bottles with the ingredients for pickling and each couple jumped into a separate bottle by which effort of course they all died immediately and became thoroughly pickled in a few minutes having previously made their wills by the assistance of the most eminent lawyers of the district in which they left strict orders that the stoppers of the seven bottles should be carefully sealed up with the blue sealing wax they had purchased and that they themselves in the bottles should be presented to the principal museum of the city of tosh to be labelled with parchment or any other anti-congenial succedaneum and to be placed on a marble table with silver gilt legs for the daily inspection and contemplation and for the perpetual benefit of the pusillanimous public and if you ever happen to go to gramble blamble and visit that museum in the city of tosh look for them on the ninety eighth table in the four hundred and twenty seventh room of the right hand corridor of the left wing of the central quadrangle of that magnificent building for if you do not 
you certainly will not see them edward lear end of chapter 111「There was an odd grey pussy bodrons, and she got away down by a water slide, and there she saw a wee robin redbreast hoppin' on a briar, and pussy bodrons says, Where's ta gone, wee robin? And wee robin says, I'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning. And pussy bodrin says, come here we robin and i'll let you see a bonny white ring round my neck but we robin says na na grey pussy bodrons na na ye worry the wee mousy but ye see na worry me so we robin flew away till he came to a fail fod dyke turf wall and there he saw a grey greedy gled hawk sitting and grey greedy gled says where's to ga we robin and we robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning and grey greedy gled says come here we robin and i'll let ye see a bonny feather in my wing but we robin says na na grey greedy gled na na ye pocket pecked a thee we linty but ye see no pook me so we robin flew away till he came to the clutch hollow o a craig and there he saw slee todd lowry sly fox sitting and slee todd lowry says where to gone we robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a song this guild you morning and see todd lowry says come here wee robin and i'll let ye see a bonny spot on the tap of my tail but wee robin says na na slee todd lowry na na ye worry the wee lammy but ye see no worry me so we robin flew away till he came to a bonny burnside and there he saw a wee callant sitting and the wee callant says where to gone wee robin and wee robin says i'm gone away to the king to sing him a sang this gid yule morning and the wee callant says come here wee robin and i'll gie you a ween grand moolins crumbs out of my pooch but wee robin says na na wee callant na na ye speldert knock down the gold pink goldfinch but ye see no spelder me so wee robin flew away till he came to the king and there he sat on a winnock sole ploughshare and sang the king a bonny sang and the king says to the queen what will ye gie to we robin for singing us this bonny sang and the queen says to the king i think we'll gie him the wee ran to be his wife so we robin and the wee ran were married and the king and the queen and the court danced at the wedding sin he flew away home to an water slide and hop it on a brier attributed to robert burns end of chapter 112 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter number 113 of tales of laughter 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Giant's Shoes once upon a time there was a large giant who lived in a small castle at least he didn't all of him live there but he managed things in this wise from his earliest youth up his legs had been of a superstitiously small size unsuited to the rest of his body so he sat upon the southwest wall of the castle with his legs inside and his right foot came out of the east gate and his left foot out of the north gate while his gloomy but spacious coat-tails covered up the south and west gates and in this way the castle was defended against all comers and was deemed impregnable by the military authorities this however as we shall soon see was not the case for the giant's boots were inside as well as his legs but as he had neglected to put them on in the giddy days of his youth he was never afterward able to do so because there was not enough room and in this bootless but compact manner he passed his time the giant slept for three weeks at a time and two days after he woke his breakfast was brought to him consisting of bright brown horses sprinkled on his bread and butter Besides his boots, the giant had a pair of shoes, and in one of them his wife lived when she was at home. On other occasions she lived in the other shoe. She was a sensible, practical kind of woman, with two wooden legs and a clothes horse, but in other respects not rich. The wooden legs were kept pointed at the end in order that, if the giant were dissatisfied with his breakfast, he might pick up any stray people that were within reach, using his wife as a fork. This annoyed the inhabitants of the district, so that they built their church in a southwestern direction from the castle, behind the giant's back, that he might not be able to pick them up as they went in but those who stayed outside to play pitch and toss were exposed to great danger and sufferings. Now in the village there were two brothers of altogether different tastes and dispositions, and talents and peculiarities and accomplishments, and in this way they were discovered not to be the same person. The elder of them was most marvelously good at singing and could sing the old hundredth and old hundred times without stopping. Whenever he did this, he stood on one leg and tied the other round his neck to avoid catching cold and spoiling his voice. But the neighbors fled, and he was also a rare hand at making guava dumplings out of three cats and a shoehorn, which is an accomplishment seldom met with. But his brother was more meagre melanguinous person and his chief accomplishment was to eat a wagon load of hay overnight and wake up thatched in the morning the whole interest of this story depends upon the fact that the giant's wife's clothes horse broke in consequence of a sudden thaw being made of organ pipes so she took off her wooden legs and stuck them in the ground tying a string from the top of one to the top of the other and hung out her clothes to dry on that now this was astutely remarked by the two brothers who therefore went up in front of the giant after he had his breakfast the giant called out fork fork but his wife trembling hid herself in the more recondite toe of the second shoe then the singing brother began to sing but he had not taken into account the pious disposition of the giant who instantly joined in the psalm and this caused the singing brother to burst his head off but as it was tied by the leg he did not lose it altogether but the other brother being well thatched on account of the quantity of hay he had eaten overnight 
lay down between the great toe of the giant and the next, and wriggled. So the giant, being unable to bear tickling in the feet, kicked out in an orthopedical manner, whereupon the castle broke, and he fell backward, and was impaled upon the sharp steeple of the church. So they put a label on him on which was written, Nupes Gigantens. That's all. William Clingdon Clifford End of chapter 113 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 114 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 114 The Farmer and the Money Lender There was once a farmer who suffered much at the hands of a money lender. Good harvests or bad, the farmer was always poor, the money lender rich. At the last, when he hadn't a farthing left, the farmer went to the money lender's house and said, You can't squeeze water from a stone, and as you have nothing to get by me now, you might tell me the secret of becoming rich. My friend, returned the money lender piously, riches come from Ram. Ask him. Thank you, I will, replied the simple farmer, so he prepared three girdle cakes to last him on the journey and set out to find Ram. First he met a Brahmin, and to him he gave a cake, asking him to point out the road to Ram. But the Brahmin only took the cake and went on his way without a word. Next the farmer met a yogi, or devotee, and to him he gave a cake, without receiving any help in return. At last he came upon a poor man sitting under a tree, and finding out he was hungry, the kindly farmer gave him his last cake, and sitting down to rest beside him, entered into conversation. "'And where are you going?' asked the poor man at length. "'Oh, I have a long journey before me, for I am going to find Ram,' replied the farmer. I don't suppose you could tell me which way to go. Perhaps I can, said the poor man, smiling, for I am Ram. What do you want of me? Then the farmer told the whole story, and Ram, taking pity on him, gave him a conch shell and showed him how to blow it in a particular way, saying, Remember, whatever you wish for, you have only to blow the conch that way, and your wish will be fulfilled. Only have a care of that money-lender, for even magic is not proof against his wiles. The farmer went back to his village rejoicing. In fact, the money-lender noticed his high spirits at once and said to himself, Some good fortune must have befallen the stupid fellow to make him hold his head so jauntily. Therefore he went over to the simple farmer's house and congratulated him on his good fortune in such cunning words, pretending to have heard all about it, that before long the farmer found himself telling the whole story, all except the secret of blowing the conch, for with all his simplicity the farmer was not quite such a fool as to tell that. Nevertheless, the money-lender determined to have the conch by hook or by crook, and as he was villain enough not to stick at trifles, he waited for a favorable opportunity and stole the conch. But, after nearly bursting himself with blowing the conch in every conceivable way, he was obliged to give up the secret as a bad job. However, being determined to succeed, he went back to the farmer and said coolly, Look here, I've got your conch, but I can't use it. You haven't got it, so it's clear you can't use it either. Business is at a standstill unless we make a bargain. Now I promise to give you back your conch, and never to interfere with your using it, on one condition, which is this, whatever you get from it, I am to get double. Never, cried the farmer, that would be the old business all over again. Not at all, replied the wily money lender. You will have your share. Now, don't be a dog in the manger, for if you get all you want, what can it matter to you if I am rich or poor? At last, though it went sorely against the grain to be of any benefit to a money lender, the farmer was forced to yield, and from that time, no matter what he gained by the power of the conch, the money lender gained double. And the knowledge that this was so preyed upon the farmer's mind day and night, so that he had no satisfaction out of anything. 
At last there came a very dry season, so dry that the farmer's crops withered for want of rain. Then he blew his conch and wished for a well to water them, and lo, there was the well, but the money-lender had two, two beautiful new wells. This was too much for any farmer to stand, and our friend brooded over it and brooded over it, till at last a bright idea came into his head. He seized the conch, blew it loudly, and cried out, O oh, Ram, I wish to be blind of one eye. And so he was, in a twinkling, but the money-lender, of course, was blind of both, and in trying to steer his way between the two new wells, he fell into one and was drowned. Now, this true story shows that a farmer once got the better of a money-lender, but only by losing one of his eyes. End of chapter 114 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 115 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Chapter 115. How the Sun, the Moon, and the Wind went out to dinner. One day the Sun, the Moon, and the Wind went out to dine with their uncle and aunt, the Thunder and Lightning. Their mother, one of the most distant stars you see far up in the sky, waited alone for her children's return. Now both the Sun and the Wind were greedy and selfish. They enjoyed the great feast that had been prepared for them, without a thought of saving any of it to take home to their mother. But the gentle moon did not forget her. Of every dainty dish that was brought round, she placed a small portion under one of her beautiful long fingernails, that the star might also have a share in the treat. On their return, their mother, who had kept watch for them all night long with her little bright eye, said, Well, children, what have you brought home for me? Then the son, who was the eldest, said, I have brought nothing home for you. I went out to enjoy myself with my friends, not to fetch a dinner for my mother. And the wind said, Neither have I brought anything home for you, mother. You could hardly expect me to bring a collection of good things for you when I merely went out for my own pleasure. But the moon said, Mother, fetch a plate, see what I have brought you and, shaking her hand, she showered down such a choice dinner as never was seen before. Then the star turned to the sun and spoke thus, Because you went out to amuse yourself with your friends, and feasted and enjoyed yourself without any thought of your mother at home, you shall be cursed. Henceforth your rays shall ever be hot and scorching, and shall burn all that they touch, and men shall hate you and cover their heads when you appear. And that is why the sun is so hot to this day. Then she turned to the wind and said, You also, who forgot your mother in the midst of your selfish pleasures, hear your doom. You shall always blow in the hot, dry weather, and shall parch and shrivel all living things, and men shall detest and avoid you from this very time. And that is why the wind in the hot weather is still so disagreeable. But to the moon she said, Daughter, because you remembered your mother and kept for her a share in your own enjoyment, from henceforth you shall be ever cool and calm and bright. No noxious glare shall accompany your pure rays, and man shall always call you blessed. And that is why the moon's light is so soft and cool and beautiful, even to this day. End of chapter 115 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 116 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wigan. Sing Raj and the cunning little jackals once upon a time in a great jungle there lived a great lion he was raja of all the country round and every day he used to leave his den in the deepest shadow of the rocks and roar with a loud angry voice and when he roared the other animals in the jungle who were all his subjects got very much frightened and ran here and there, and Singh Raj 
would pounce upon them and kill them and gobble them up for his dinner this went on for a long long time until at last there were no living creatures left in the jungle but two little jackals raj jackal and a rene jackal husband and wife a very hard time of it the poor little jackals had running this way and that to escape the terrible singh raj and every day the little rene jackal would say to her husband i am afraid he will catch us to-day do you hear how he is roaring oh dear oh dear and he would answer her never fear i will take care of you let us run on a mile or two come come quick 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 and they would both run away as fast as they could after some time spent in this way they found however one fine day that the lion was so close upon them that they could not escape then the little rene jackal said husband husband i feel much frightened the singh raj is so angry he will certainly kill us at once what can we do but he answered cheer up we can save ourselves yet come and i'll show you how we may manage it so what did these cunning little jackals do but they went to the great lion's den and when he saw them coming he began to roar and shake his mane and he said you little wretches come and be eaten at once i have had no dinner for three whole days and all that time i have been running over hill and dale to find you roar roar come and be eaten i say and he lashed his tail and gnashed his teeth and looked very terrible indeed then the jackal rajah creeping quite close up to him said oh great singh raj we all know you are our master and we would have come at your bidding long ago but indeed sir there is a much bigger raj even than you in this jungle and he tried to catch hold of us and eat us up and frightened us so much that we were obliged to run away what do you mean growled singh raj there is no king in the jungle but me ah sir answered the jackal in truth one would think so for you are very dreadful your very voice is death but it is as we say for we with our own eyes have seen one with whom you could not compete whose equal you can no more be than we are yours whose face is as flaming fire his step as thunder and his power supreme it is impossible interrupted the old lion but show me this rajah of whom you speak so much that i may destroy him instantly then the little jackals ran on before him until they reached a great well and pointing down to his own reflection in the water they said see sir there lives the terrible king of whom we spoke when singh raj looked down the well he became very angry for he thought he saw another lion there he roared and shook his great mane and the shadow lion shook his and looked terribly defiant at last beside himself with rage at the violence of his opponent singh raj sprang down to kill him at once but no other lion was there only the treacherous reflection and the sides of the well were so steep that he could not get out again to punish the two jackals who peeped over the top after struggling for some time in the deep water he sank to rise no more and the little jackals threw stones down upon him from above and danced round and round the well singing ayo 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 the king of the forest is dead is dead we have killed the great lion who would have killed us ayo 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 ring a ting ding a ting ring a ting ding a ling ayo 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 end of chapter a hundred and sixteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one hundred and seventeen 
of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. Harris Sermon there was a certain brahman in a certain village named harasarman he was poor and foolish and in evil case for want of employment and he had very many children that he might reap the fruit of his misdeeds in a former life he wandered about begging with his family and at last he reached a certain city and entered the service of a rich householder called stultata his sons became keepers of stultata's cows and other property and his wife a servant to him and he himself lived near his house performing the duty of an attendant one day there was a feast on account of the marriage of the daughter of stultata largely attended by many friends of the bridegroom and merrymakers harrisarman hoped that he would be able to fill himself up to the throat with ghee and flesh and other dainties and get the same for his family in the house of his patron while he was anxiously expecting to be fed no one thought of him then he was distressed at getting nothing to eat and he said to his wife at night it is owing to my poverty and stupidity that i am treated with such disrespect here so i will pretend by means of an artifice to possess a knowledge of magic so that i may become an object of respect to this still data so when you get an opportunity tell him that i possess magical knowledge he said this to her and after turning the matter over in his mind while people were asleep he took away from the house of stultata a horse on which his master's son-in-law rode he placed it in concealment at some distance and in the morning his friends of the bridegroom could not find the horse though they searched in every direction then while stultata was distressed at the evil omen and searching for thieves who had carried off the horse the wife of harasman came and said to him my husband is a wise man skilled in astrology and magical sciences he can get the horse back for you why do you not ask him when stultata heard that he called harasman who said yesterday i was forgotten but to-day now the horse is stolen i am called to mind and stultata then repeated the brahmin with these words i forgot you forgive me and asked him to tell him who had taken away their horse then harassman drew all kinds of pretended diagrams and said the horse has been placed by thieves on the boundary line south from this place it is concealed there and before it is carried off to a distance as it will be at close of day go quickly and bring it when they heard that many men ran and brought the horse quickly praising the discernment of harasman then harasman was honored by all men as a sage and dwelt there in happiness honored by stultata now as days went on much treasure both of gold and jewels had been stolen by a thief from the palace of the king as the thief was not known the king quickly summoned harrisman on account of his reputation for knowledge of magic and he when summoned tried to gain time and said i will tell you to-morrow and then he was placed in a chamber by the king and carefully guarded and he was sad because he had pretended to have knowledge now in that palace there was a maid named jehiva which means tongue who with the assistance of her brother had stolen that treasure from the interior of the palace she being alarmed at harasman's knowledge 
went at night and applied her ear to the door of that chamber in order to find out what he was about and harassman who was alone inside was at that very moment blaming his own tongue that had made a vain assumption of knowledge he said o oh, tongue what is this that you have done through your greediness wicked one you will soon receive punishment in full when jehiva heard this she thought in her terror that she had been discovered by this wise man and she managed to get in where he was and falling at his feet she said to the supposed wizard brahman here i am that jiva whom you have discovered to be the thief of the treasure and after i took it i buried it in the earth in the garden behind the palace under a pomegranate tree so spare me and receive the small quantity of gold which is in my possession when harisaman heard that he said to her proudly depart i know all this i know the past present and future but i will not denounce you being a miserable creature that is implored my protection but whatever gold is in your possession you must give back to me when he said this to the maid she consented and departed quickly but harassman reflected in his astonishment fate brings about as if in sport things impossible for when calamity was so near who would have thought chance would have brought us success while i was blaming my jehiva the thief jehiva suddenly flung herself at my feet secret crimes manifest themselves by means of fear thus thinking he passed the night happily in the chamber and in the morning he brought the king by some skilful parade of pretended knowledge into the garden and led him up to the treasure which was buried under the pomegranate tree and said that the thief had escaped with part of it then the king was pleased and gave him the revenue of many villages but the minister named devanjanin whispered in the king's ear how can a man possess such knowledge unattainable by men without having studied the books of magic you may be certain that this is a specimen of the way he makes a dishonest livelihood by having a secret intelligence with thieves it will be much better to test him by some new artifice then the king of his own accord brought a covered picture into which he had thrown a frog and said to harassman brahm if you can guess what there is in this picture i will do you great honor today when the brahm harassman heard that he thought that his last hour had come and he called to mind the pet name of froggy which his father had given him in his childhood in sport and impelled by luck he called to himself by his pet name lamenting his hard fate and suddenly called out this is a fine picture for you froggy it will soon become the swift destroyer of your helpless self the people there when they heard him say that raised a shout of applause because his speech chimed in so well with the object presented to him and murmured ah a great sage he knows even about the frog then the king thinking that this was all due to the knowledge of divination was highly delighted and gave harassman the revenue of more villages with gold an umbrella and state carriages of all kinds so harassman prospered in the world end of chapter 117 recording by lindemarie nielsen vancouver bc